hats off to everyone who's here. I don't want to be like uh, I was looking at this hat that I bought last uh, week in Florence and it was damn hot and I said I'm going to stop wearing it here because I look like a walking tribute to William Burroughs. <laughs> also, I want to say thank you to Steve again and again. And really, I cannot overstate for what he did with his maintenance series, you know, for the European poetry and wider. And I hope he's going to do another one. You know, so then you'll see what the power of poetry is all about. But uh, to use the time really efficiently, I'm going to start reading. First poem is called The Fifties, and it's actually a take after Adam Zagajewski's uh, poem called The Forties, where Adam is writing. It's a fairly short piece where he's trying to uh, reconnect with the time before he was uh, uh, born. Actually, it's called The Thirties, not born in the Forties. Mine is called The Fifties, and it's trying to reconnect uh, with the decade before I was born, and also it's reference to the Fifties that hopefully I'm going to fit in a couple of, a couple of years. Also, uh, it's a bit inspired by a story of my father and grandfather actually who back in the 50s they used to walk for 45 uh, kilometers to see soccer a game. I mean, we're talking about uh, you know, dedication to football, I think that's very remarkable from this perspective. Okay, the 50s. Father and his father stomped down the gravel road all the way to the town to see a football game. High noon buzzes through the young summer air. The roar of cicadas is in the pine trees. Glassy hoppers glint in the grass. The Mediterranean, as we once knew it, is still there. A bit further to the north, the airy crowns of convicts melt under the belting sun, dripping like the sweat underneath their sleeveless white t-shirts as their sad and bitter sigh carries itself all the way to the gray Maltese docks, then echoing out into the icy mountains of the Altai region in the Far East. Somewhere behind Zhrnovnica, grandfather, like an ancient lizard, suddenly scowls his fissured face, wincing from his tight shoes that are killing him, that damn pair of footwear he's sharing with his first cousin, a locksmith who compulsively steals rusty pliers and steel nails from the dusty workshop of the local power plant, absolutely unable to explain to himself for what purpose in the devil's name he needs them all for. Simultaneously, in a Dedinia salon in Belgrade, Tito cracks jokes as comrades from the Central Committee laugh raucously while he tries out his new metallic, polished as the dog's balls, light-duty lake machine. All across the country, generations with pointy chins, much like Modigliani's, are busy building socialism with a human face. The system that would gradually, like mean drops of vitriol, burn a deep hole in their souls. But in father's head, the world still bubbles unexplored, floating like a translucent jellyfish across the unsailed sea, as he daydreams of a new DKW motorcycle, as black and shiny as Silvana Magnano's high heels, and as powerful as Mons Yerko's untied robe. So in my thoughts, for I can't help it, I worry endlessly about that boy, because I know his ride would be an uncertain and a long one. I wish I could tell him not to worry, to relax and take it easy, for everything will more or less someday fall into place. But words fail to leave me. Perhaps I have no mouth to speak them yet. Perhaps I'm not around as much as I should be. Perhaps I am myself still only slowly but surely just getting there. Another poem I'd like to read is called Endocrine Lyric, and it's uh, about the episode in the life of the great poet, the poet William Butler Yeats. A few months ago, I wanted to read it in a court, and then I stopped at the last moment. I didn't have the guts to read it in front of the Irish audience. <laughs> so maybe here I can feel a little bit more relaxed. It's a kind of a documentary one. Endocrine lyric. In 1934, having lost his patroness, who for 40 years supported his writing and political engagement, W.B. Yeats, the Nobel Prize winner, old and alone, began suffering from high blood pressure and the falling heart to the point, failing heart to the point that his creativity almost waned. But Yeats, that mystic who would frown upon any form of impersonal science, had heard somewhere about the latest rejuvenation treatment and to the horror of his friends found an Australian sexologist on Harley Street in London, who in the spring of the same year performed on him the so-called Steinach operation, a kind of vasectomy, in fact, which first, the first tested in Vienna, which allegedly restored the dormant drive. The surgery appeared successful, judging by the letters to his friends, 
wherein William proudly claimed that he had regained his sexual desire and had fallen in love with the young and talented poets, poetess Margaret Rudder, who was then all of 27, in contrast to his right to 69. The cynical Dubliners immediately began calling him a glen old man, but W.B. began writing poetry again, and that was what matters the most. One of those new poems entitled The Spur went like this. You think it horrible that lust and rage should dance attention upon my old age. They were not such a plague when I was young. What else have I to spur me into song? William soon compiled the Oxford Book of Modern Words and started working on a new edition of his collected poems, so intensely as if claimed the witnesses. He'd been given a new lease on life. Five long years later, he died of heart failure on the French Riviera of all places imaginary. Uh, one more piece called Across the Street from Spinoza's House. This is actually uh, about this, this uh, curious juxtaposition that I have on, the, on the, my Samizdat uh, uh, chapel. In The Hague, Spinoza, as you know, the great philosopher, uh, uh, lived, as they called him, the pantheistic uh, monist. It's kind of a weird thing. But nowadays, across from his uh, window, his house, there's a division of a red light district, you know. So to me, it was a very incongruous kind of uh, thing, you know, having this, like, a modification of body, you know, in contrast, you know, to this hyper-idealization of mind, you know, finally coming together, you know, towards the beginning of 21st century. So that's what I try, that's the situation of the setup that I tried to squeeze this poem out of. It's called Across the Street from Spinoza's House. So here I am again, observing certain ladies in a small alley across the street from Spinoza's house, remembering how ten or so years ago, some of us landed here around about the same time in desperate search for jobs, craving with every limb those ripe fruits of the democratic West, or however you'd like to put it. These ladies subjected to monetary and flesh exchange and me pursuing the articles, paragraphs, and subparagraphs of my esteemed institution. And at the very first sight, I begin to realize that even after a decade buried in a foreign country, we still have a lot in common. Flexible working hours, suspicion towards other foreigners, and similar modes of prostitution. I see the absent-minded Heloise still wearing some embroidery, and Alina swiftly changing stations on her red transistor radio, and Amra and Jamila laughing uproariously as they pet the bald head of their big black friend, while I push my bicycle like a wheel of destiny thinking how at this very moment from Spinoza's window, all the way to the last booth with the red lights on, freely and easily bloom and open on the winds of Euclidean geometry, a thousand flowers of some invisible Bermuda triangle, composed of human petals, dipped deep in the mud of the so-called better life, like those stones trapped in the kidney channels of our third world bodies that we dragged over here like decanted sandboats from our Belarusians, Ukrainians, Ugandas, Kyrgyzias, Ghanas, Romanians, Croatias, only to end up staring at each other in silence like those eels in the aquariums of Chinese restaurants. And even if somebody would turn us upside down, slap us all over and connect us to some cosmic polygraph, he would sadly be unable to squeeze out of us a single line from Baruch's great ethics. And the uh, uh, final piece perhaps is called Destiny's Child. It's a funny story behind it, kind of. Uh, it's dedicated to Beyonce, the great uh, R&B star, you know, <laughs> who actually changed my life. Uh, that was a decade ago when I was in New York. She was still with a band called The Destiny's Child. It appears I know a lot about this, but you know, it just happened like that. And uh, they were performing in the street, uh, somewhere near the Pulitzer Fountain, close to the Central Park. And then something dragged me forward, so I had to come close to the stage to check out this, uh, this band. And then that's how the poem was born. A year later, actually, in retrospect. It's called Destiny's Child. Dear Beyoncé, a few months before 9-11, I saw you on the Upper East Side, near Central Park, where together with your band, Destiny's Child, up on a makeshift stage on the back of a flatbed truck, probably as part of some advertising campaign, painfully sensual and scantily dressed, you launched into a series of your hits. Bills, 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 book a boo, boo delicious, survivor. Miraculously, I managed to squeeze through the crowd and get real close to the stage, only to be shocked suddenly by the golden bulk of your gaze. It felt like being whipped by an electrical sea animal, fueled by the flapping of a thousand wings of Tesla's pigeons still nesting on the roof of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. It was a sensation more profound and powerful than the mightiest Satori, 
So I did everything in my power to fight it off. Painfully stretched like a laocoon between your watery reptilian pupils, dumbfounded and pounded into the New York City asphalt in my worn out All Star sneakers, close to the intersection of the 59th Street and the 5th Avenue, not far from the Pulitzer Fountain. Desperately trying in my misery to wriggle out of that forceful magic grip of yours, I began thinking all kinds of twisted thoughts, remembering Balkan war criminals the living skeletons behind barbed wire fences of their concentration camps, remembering mad cow disease, the throbbing heads of poisoned cattle, remembering the creation political scene and all that endless inter-party bickering, remembering the prophecies and auguries of Magda Logomer, the 18th century witch of Križetsi, remembering the black-clad right-wingers and the profound and mysterious ways of the creation post-socialist transition, remembering new agers attending all those courses for spiritual renewal, Remembering the stigmas of a certain initiate from one of our islands, remembering my mom's Vileda cleaning ramps and those black circles underneath Yuri Gagarin's eyes. Remembering the bonobo chimpanzees who resolve all of their political disputes by means of mutual masturbation. Remembering Agul, the devil star that darkens every two days, 20 hours and 53 minutes. Remembering the Christmas photographs of my uncle taken in the early 70s in faraway Canberra. In Australia, where the whole family poses in checkered shirts on a shiny lawn next to a neatly grown flower bed as their faces grow silvery reflected onto the shiny hood of a brand new Holden. And further down, following the same train of thought, all the way to Lianovich's imported hens, 100% pure kangaroo meat, and the wall of wind and the wail of homeless did you reduce rumbling down the Amsterdam sidewalks. But nothing helped. Because in the flaming blaze of your gaze, that you whipped me so stunningly, I could see as if bewitched a good deal of my future, not liking it for one bit so wet and wooden like freshly cut up tuna fish. And I realized that I wouldn't remain much longer with a woman standing beside me at that very moment, although we were exceptionally tender and intimate with each other, and even had lunch at that very afternoon at Woody Allen's Carnegie Deli, polishing off sizable and tasty Broadway Danny Rose sandwiches and then photographed each other underneath the rusty fire escape in Little Italy above which someone forgot to take off the glowing neon sign that read, perfect relationship. <laughs> but nothing seemed to work because that look of yours, Beyonce, said it loudly and clearly, many a desert thou shall cross before, before what you forgot to add. And so I'm sitting here all alone in a foreign country in an apartment above a dingy coffee shop with an exceptionally good selection of Moroccan hashish Vista, King Hassan, Caramello, Palm, Zero, whose smoke is drilling through the dried out wooden floors of this ancient Dutch Helen house. As I'm writing these simple but honest, almost meme ethical lines for you, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, Beyonce, Giselle Knowles, you wondrous beauty. So this one's for you, dear Beyonce, honey bunny, sweet child of mine. For you, my divinely proportioned and dark complexioned destiny's child, who so efficiently, irrevocably, almost biblically foretold my fate between two fiery R&B flips of those shiny locks of yours, so cruel and exacting like those curvy lines on the skin of that python of fortune that just as well might have been an ordinary circus animal whose legitimate trainers answer to the names of one Moira and Orpheus. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.